and welcome to the Gothic Unicorn. Today I'm showing off the finished Raven's Perch project and in order to do that I'm going to tell you a story. This is the story behind the house that I've created. Now to do this, to make it easier and um, better for you to see the details, the story is going to be told over a series of still photos. So sit back and enjoy. The Haunting of Night's Rise. For all the family stories I had heard from my grandparents, I'd never heard about Night's Rise until I was in my thirties. I might never have known the place if my relationship had not broken up and I had been in need of a refuge. I was in the process of moving out of the house we had shared and unable to move into my new home for several weeks. When out of the blue, my grandmother requested that I help her out. Can you take some time off work if you want? She'd asked. Well, yes. They said I could take my time off if I needed to. I just cannot face going anywhere with people enjoying themselves. What if you were to help me out? My confusion must have been obvious because she chuckled before continuing. I need someone to check my aunt's house. I haven't been there since before your grandfather passed away and whilst the caretakers tell me everything is all right, I would like to know for myself. But that's been years, I began. Well, yes. Your uncle refuses to take me, says it's a horrible place. So you want me to take you? No, I want you to go on my behalf. I'm getting too old to go traipsing across the country. Check the place out and make sure everything is okay. And that is how I found myself at Night's Rise, or Aunt, Aunt Rose's house, as my grandmother called it. Aunt Rose had been my great-grandmother's oldest sister and had lived to the age of 102. She had outlived most of her family and had left a complicated will that had resulted in my grandmother being in charge of a trust and thus Night's Rise. Following my grandmother's instructions, I pulled off the road through a pair of rusted gates and followed the winding tree-lined drive. After climbing for what seemed like an age, the drive abruptly ended in a gravelled area and I parked next to a car I hoped belonged to the caretaker I was supposed to meet. Looking around, I got out of the car and noticed another set of rusty gates and beyond them, on the top of the hill, a house straight out of a horror movie. Oh good, you've arrived, a cheery voice called out. Mrs Jones, I questioned. Yes, dear, but you can call me Gwen. Mrs Jones was my mother-in-law, and although she's been gone for 15 years, I still expect her to be behind me every time someone calls me that. We've been expecting you. I'm glad to hear that. I thought maybe Granny was fooling with me. Oh, I've got the house ready for you, clean sheets and all that. You'll have to excuse a few things, but the place doesn't like change, and we've learned to go with the flow, so to speak. I've warned them you're coming though. You've warned them? Who are they? I thought the house was empty. Your grandmother didn't tell you then? Oh dear, that was naughty of her. It's not my place to interfere, but there's something in that house. We find it easier just to tell the place what's going on, so introduce yourself and you'll be fine. She pressed a set of old keys into my hand. Now I must go. I'll close the gates at the bottom on my way out. With that, the jolly caretaker climbed into her car and with a wave left me alone in the shadow of night's rise. I gathered my things out of my car and with trepidation followed the gravel path through the gates. It was instantly clear why I had to leave the car where it was because the path rose quite steeply to the house which seemed to emerge straight out of the rock. As I got closer, its similarity to something from a classic horror film was even more obvious, and I wondered how something like this had ended up in the quaint little town I had passed through at the bottom of the hill. The steps to the porch creaked as I climbed them. I put my things on a decrepit-looking bench and cautiously unlocked the door. Hello, 
I called out as I opened the door. I'm Dora's granddaughter. She asked me to come see you. I wondered what I was doing as I fetched my things and continued talking to the house. I don't want to bother you, but I'll be here for a few days. I paused, wondering what to do next, and then jumped as the heavy front door shut itself firmly behind me, with a noise that sounded like the house sighed. It was going to be a long few days. It did not take me long to walk around the whole house and establish what was where. All the time I kept thinking I could hear whispering voices, sometimes ahead of me and sometimes behind me. It was quite disconcerting and they got louder as I got further up the house. By the time I reached the storeroom in the tower they were so loud that I had to speak. Are you trying to tell me something? I'm afraid I don't understand you. There was another noise like a loud sigh and the whispers went silent. I looked around the room, which contained nothing but a chair and a large linen press. What is it, I mused? What do you want? Above me there was a loud bang, and I looked up in alarm. There's something up there. I wasn't at the top of the tower, because in the ceiling I noticed a hatch to the tower attic. I'll never get up there, I mused. The ceilings are too high. I shook my head. The house was obviously getting to me. There were no more unexplained noises that first evening and I was starting to think that I'd imagined things as I got ready for bed. I was messaging a friend, grateful that there was such a good phone signal at such a remote house. It could be stunning, I wrote. It's just kind of sad for some reason and really needs to live again. My friend responded with a string of confused emojis and I wondered, not for the first time, why night's rise had gotten under my skin. I woke in the middle of the night to the howling of wind and the sound of one of the shutters in the tower banging. Pulling on my dressing gown, I headed for the stairs, thinking it was probably from the storeroom. As I climbed the stairs, I could hear another noise, a rhythmic creaking, as if something was being rocked on the floorboards. I secured the shutter and checked the adjacent attic bedroom, but there was nothing that could rock. And eventually I went back to bed, pulling the pillow over my head to block out the noise so I could sleep. Over the next couple of days, I explored the house and the local area. When I came back, the house seemed pleased I'd returned, although each night I was woken by the howling wind, the shutter that would not stay secured and that creepy rocking noise that I assumed must be coming from the tower attic. I discovered that Aunt Rose, my great grand aunt if I wanted to be exact, and what appeared to be her entire family were buried close to the house. That prompted a call to my grandmother. You never told me I would be staying in a graveyard. Oh, I forgot about the graves. I don't know if anyone is actually buried there. I mean, Aunt Rose's ashes are there, as she requested, but I don't know about Uncle Albert or the children. They all died before I was born. I'd shaken my head at that thought. You mean she lived here alone for over 60 years? I suppose she must have done. Her husband's family died out and my mother and I used to visit her, but she would never come and visit us or anyone else. After that call, I felt sad for the lady who had lived out her life in this weird house alone and started to understand why so little had changed. It was obvious that at times someone had persuaded her to make some changes. But I was certain that most of the house was as it had been when she had lost her family. On my fourth night, I lost my temper with the house. I had woken again to the sound of howling wind that had not been forecast, a banging shutter and that strange creaking rocking noise from the tower attic. Stop it, I shouted. If you want my help, you will need to help me. I have no idea what you want. Aunt Rose, is that you? I need to know what you want. The noise has stopped suddenly. Well, what is it? If you can do all of this, you can point me in the right direction. 
Afterwards, I had stomped back to bed, cussing under my breath about unhelpful relatives and had heard nothing more the entire night. The following morning, I woke after the best sleep I'd had in the house. I put my foot to the floor to get up and it connected with a book. I bent down confused because I'd not been reading the previous night and picked up a small leather-bound journal I'd never seen before. Opening it, I read a little and realised that it was Aunt Rose's journal and almost a century old. I sat and read for most of the morning, thankful that her handwriting was neat and precise and not moving until I'd finished the volume. Unsure what to do next, I'd gone to the kitchen to make tea and on the top of the stove was a second, similar book. I examined it to find another journal from later in Aunt Rose's life. I'd made my tea and again sat reading. By the end of that second volume, I felt like I knew what was going on with the house. For the first few years of their marriage, Rose and her husband Albert had been very happy in the house, which had been given to them by her husband's parents. They had had two sons and life was generally good. Then Rose had become pregnant a third time and had asked for the family crib back from her husband's sister. The sister had refused because she was hoping for more babies of her own. It had caused a lot of anger within the family and eventually, in an effort to calm his wife, Albert had finally convinced his sister to return the crib. Rose had irrationally hated the crib from the moment it was brought back into the house and when the local girl who acted as a nursemaid for the children said it rocked on its own when no one was near it, demanded that it be taken away. Albert had refused and told them they were being silly. Then their sons had gotten ill. First one and then the other came down with an illness that no doctor could explain and after weeks of sickness, died within two hours of each other. Rose was beside herself, and fearing for her and their unborn child, Albert finally agreed to get rid of the crib. But instead of taking it out of the house, he'd put it up into the tower attic. For a time, things improved a little, and the couple were looking forward to the, new, the arrival of the new baby. And then, Poor Albert was killed in an accident in town. Shortly after his funeral, Rose had had his ashes and those of the boys interred near the house. And on learning this, Albert's sister had phone, flown into a rage over how Rose could be so stupid. Her children would inherit the house, she'd claimed, and who would want to live with a graveyard? Rose was confused because she was still carrying Albert's child but his sister had explained that she'd placed a curse on the crib and on Rose's family and as long as it was in the house Rose would not prosper. She'd also announced with glee that Albert hadn't thrown the crib out and that it was still in the house. Rose had thrown Albert's sister out of the house and told her never to return. That she would ensure that she and her family never again lived at night's rise. After the argument, Rose had gone into labour early and after several days had delivered a daughter who had lived for less than a week. Afterwards, Rose had been determined to get revenge on the one she believed had ruined her life and, after speaking to a local wise woman, had concocted a plan of her own. A plan that in later life Rose had come to regret. Albert's sister, meanwhile, had outlived all of her children and the family line had died out, but something remained in the house and had haunted Rose until the end. After reading the story in Aunt Rose's own words, I'd sat for a long time before deciding what I must do. Resolved, I had called Gwen and asked for assistance. Gwen and her husband John had been confused by my request, but nevertheless I managed to convince them to help me and John Jones helped me get a ladder into the top tower room so I could get up into the tower attic. They waited in the storage room whilst I climbed up into the attic and located what I was looking for. It wasn't difficult because as I pushed open the hatch, I heard the rocking begin. I crawled across the dusty floor and with the torch on my phone, peered into the wooden crib. 
and saw the mummified remains of Rose's last baby. The wise woman had told her to give the crib a baby and as she had, who knows what reason, replaced the body in the tiny coffin with a doll, Rose had wrapped the remains of her daughter and carried them up to the attic where she had found the crib. Whilst it had appeased the crib, the house itself had become restless, wanted by her dead family perhaps, and later by Rose, who alone knew her baby's fate. Together, Gwen, John and I removed the crib and put the baby's remains into a wooden box I had found in the bedroom. That wooden box we buried in front of the cross bearing the baby's name whilst we burnt the crib out there on the cliff top. That night, the house was silent. I sat up for hours waiting for something, although I didn't know what. Eventually, as dawn was beginning to break, the house made a noise. But instead of the size I'd become used to, it was different, and it sounded to me as if the house said, thank you. I left the house that morning knowing that at last a new chapter in its story could begin and wondering just how I was going to explain everything to my grandmother.